Yesterday, in the Garden of Peace and Serenity, I watched a new play called The Peach Blossom Fan, which told of recent events in the city of Nanjing during the final years of the Ming Dynasty. Borrowing the sentiments of romance to portray the impact of dynastic rise and fall, this play concerned real events, real people, and was founded on real evidence. As an even greater pleasure, I myself, despite being past my prime, was pulled up on stage to perform. This stirred me up so much that I laughed, I cried, I showed my fury and I cursed, all in turn. In that performance hall, filled to the brim with guests, how could anyone have known that I too was a character in the play? Blossom Fan is a Xuan Shi by Chinese playwright Kong Shengren. Its story recounts the last days of the dying Ming Dynasty. The quote which I just read comes from the Master of Ceremonies character in the play's prologue. Such exposition as this isn't atypical of plays in this genre or time. What is, is his existence in so liminal a space. A space which contains this whole play. Edges of identity are tested. Texts from many other Chinese works are interspersed. Every line is blurred, which is fitting, I think for a play which depicts a transition from Ming to King. Now, I'm not going to go so far into detail. Uh, the plot more so will when I get to that. I want to talk about quickly just some of the differences between the Han Chinese of the Ming, or ancient Chinese, and the Manchu Chinese of the King. The dominant dialect had shifted, customs were changing, even hair and dress, especially hair and dress. Your choice as a Han was to get with the program or uh, go live on a rock, pretty much. I gave great attention to the clothing here for what impact that would have on the costumes of the stage. The plot. A rising scholar, Hao Feng Yu, falls in love with the courtesan Li Zheng Jun. Translation, fragrant princess. They wed and he sends her a fan. In southern Ming, Wu Cheng commander Zhu Liang Yu summons Hao to help move his army towards Nanjing. Hao refuses in a letter and is forced to flee to shelter with Shi Kefa. At the same time, a leader of the peasant rebellion, Li Zhi Chang, captures Beijing, and the emperor hangs himself from a tree. A new emperor is crowned, and reformists are now targeted. One of the emperor's henchmen, Tian Yang, summons Li Zhengzhen for to re-wed her. She protests by bashing her head on a pillar, splattering blood all over the fan. Yang draws peach blossom branches on it with the blood, thus making it the peach blossom fan. The fan is sent to Hao, and Li is sent before the emperor. Hao tries to flee to Nanjing, but is captured by the villainous Yuan Di Cheng and sent to prison. A Taoist ceremony plays out, mourning the Ming Dynasty. The two lovers meet at Qixiang Mountain, where there the Taoist master Zhang Yaojing criticizes their affair. The one becomes a nun, and the other a priest, fated to not see one another again. In 2004, the California Institute of Arts staged their own production of The Peach Blossom Fan, adapted by Edward Mast and directed by Chen Shi Zhang, who's probably most well known for his 1999 production of The Peony Pavilion, which ran for 19 hours start to finish. Stephen Merritt of The Magnetic Fields, number four on my Spotify rap, did the song and lyrics for this. Uh, I like him a lot, and I didn't know that until I started researching for this, so that's pretty cool. A lot of the songs are character introductions where the character will come out and sing about who they are. This aligns with the original play where the characters would do exactly that. A lot, a lot of instruments are used from all over. The Yang King is pretty prominent, but so are steel drums, the double bass, and ukuleles. This is all to hit at the purpose of multicultural blending, or defying cultural boundaries. The casting was incredibly diverse, race and gender, but also where the backgrounds these actors and actresses came from. Zhao Long, for instance, is the only professional Chinese opera actor in the company, as General Shi Ko Fa, and they have him speak in Mandarin the whole time, which is questionable, but okay. The male prime minister is played by a woman. Professional actors were cast alongside students who were working towards their BFAs, like SNL actress Cecily Strong. Much of this play's events take place in a post-pop, funky-looking brothel. Instead of a curtain, the actors come from out behind translucent plastic strips. And the whole time, this dragonfly sculpture is suspended from the ceiling, lowered sometimes for to act as the Emperor's throne. I reached out to the artist, Sandy Hughes. Uh, go follow her on Instagram. And she could not have been more helpful. She sent me a ton of photos from behind the scenes, so I'm just gonna show you some now. 
Another interesting thing about the staging is there was sometimes a projector screen playing images specifically to act as a distancing device. The term is a Brechtian distancing device. To achieve a distancing effect, or alienation effect, or defamiliarization, or estrangement. Basically to prevent the audience from sympathizing, empathizing with any of the characters, and to try to reach observers on a more conscious, intellectual level. This was coined in a paper by German playwright Baird Holt Brecht, titled Alienation Effects in Chinese Acting. There's a lot going on, and not everything works all the time. Some critics say the show as a whole lacks cohesion, which, and I haven't seen it, but I can see it. Some of the attempts at mashing different cultures at times comes off as dissonant, like the lone Mandarin speaking actor, for instance, or some choreographed hand gestures which are more befitting of a thespian wearing water sleeves. There's a lot of new characters, or their names are changed, but the spirit of the original production is still there. The characters seen are dimensional and interesting, the historical context is not shy from at all, and the soundtrack's pretty good. That's about it. I want to talk about the villain Yuan De Cheng. I only said his name once, but he comes up a lot. He was there when they crowned the new emperor. He slandered Hao Feng Yu, which had forced him then to hide. He sent Li Zheng Jun to court and oversaw she got remarried. At the play's beginning, he sends her clothes for having been wed, but Li rejects them, speaking much to the weight of one's wardrobe and what that represents. Uh, more to that, there's a scene where Shi Kefa, before suiciding himself in a river, takes off all of his clothes so as to strip his person of status and any meaning, really. Yun was more than just a politician in his time, he was also a dramatist himself. The B-plot, if I may, of this play follows Yun's production of his play, The Swallow Letter, from writing it to staging it and casting it. He even asks at one point Lee to be in it as a chow, a uh, word for clown type role. As much of a reflection of himself is this a parallel reflection of Kong Sheng Gren. Here is a playwright within a play, an entirely new trope, a meta-commentary not just on the history of China, but the history of theater. Kong Sheng Gren is a 64th generation descendant of Confucius. He spent much time working on tracing his ancestral lineage. The spirit of the Peach Blossom fan is imbibed by anecdotes he asked his family for about their time transitioning. The Master of Ceremony characters is said to be himself. In no way can the man be removed from the piece for how personal the themes here are to him. One of the final scenes, a haunting tune, even takes place on the 17th day of the ninth month of 1648, the day Shang Grim was born.